Good morning, Rock Fellowship. It is so good to be streaming with you this morning, this amazing, great Palm Sunday, the Sunday where we celebrate and kick off Holy Week. We're kicking off Passion Week where we celebrate the mission and purpose that Jesus came into the world to save sinners like me and like you, and we're so grateful to be celebrating with you this morning. So I'm going to invite you right where you are in your house, if you're in your pajamas, even if you've gotten up and got dressed up and looking nice and feeling fresh, however you are right now, I'm going to invite you to stand on your feet with your family, with your friends, and worship with us. Come on. Lord, we thank you for this morning where we're able to give your name praise and honor. So says, praise. the day and then what happens and in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away you please because we know when we see your face that's where we get our encouragement from that's why the song says when we see you we find strength to face the day that's good news that's good and in your presence all our fears are washed away come on let's encourage ourselves and let's sing that when we see you we find strength to face the day
you guys are enjoying these services and we hope that it serves as a means of encouragement to get you guys started on another week of um, social distancing. And you know, I know it can be easy for us to isolate ourselves during this time. So before we dive into the next song, I just wanted to share a brief song, or excuse me, a brief story of encouragement for you guys. Um, it started about a couple weeks ago when the rules on social distancing kind of got more strict. And I just decided to pray a prayer like, hey Lord, how can you continue to use me in a time where I can't physically touch another person? And so I went about doing my walk um, like I usually do in the evenings with the dog and the kids. And as I was walking, this lady kind of stopped me and started a casual conversation. And I'm usually not the type of person who just stops and talks to random people just because I'm trying to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And I'm trying to keep an eye on the kids and just make sure everything's going well. And something prompted me to stop and talk to her. And I believe that was the Holy Spirit. And a casual conversation turned from her just talking kind of casually and sharing her life story. And as she was sharing it, she kind of broke down. And you could just see that she was at a point where she was questioning God and she didn't understand why he would allow such things to happen. And she knew that she had done some things wrong, but for this amount of hurt and suffering, why? And so a casual conversation turned into an opportunity to be able to pray for her. And over the next couple of days, anytime I would think about her, I would pray for her. When I would go out walking, I would see her, I would stop, make casual conversation, continue to encourage her. And one day, Ryan, my husband, was with me, and we both stopped and talked to her, and we prayed a very specific prayer over her life. And at the end of that prayer, we shared um, our phone numbers, and I was like, well, if you need anything, just give us a call, we're right across the street. And not 48 hours later, she sent me a text rejoicing that a situation that she thought was dead hadn't changed for years. God had already moved like that. And that relit a fire in her, and it gave her a source of encouragement. And it did the same for me, because it's like, wow, we're not supposed to be engaging with people. We're supposed to be going about our day as quickly as possible. But if we are willing to let the Lord use us, he will do just that. So I want to encourage you guys. Yes, we want to practice safety and we want to be smart and we want to do the things that we're supposed to do to keep ourselves safe, but don't shut yourself off so that the Lord can't use you in this way. So that is our prayer today, Lord, that you would give us hearts that are willing to be used by you in a time where it's so easy to isolate ourselves and to only think about me, myself, and I. Allow us to be able to stay kingdom-minded and kingdom-focused so that you can get the glory, amen. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes.
people who are in fear right now, who have unanswered questions, and so that your handprint can be left all over this situation, and they're left with nothing but to give you the glory. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open. Come on, let's go ahead and put our hands together for our awesome King, our God, who has loved us, who has demonstrated his love towards us. And I pray that you enjoy that time of worship as we sang not one but two songs shouting Hosanna is the shout, was the proclamation, was the song that the disciples of Jesus sang on this Palm Sunday morning as he entered into Jerusalem coming from the Mount of Olives. And we celebrate today. Um, I'm so glad to be able to worship with you all, even when it's like this. And I pray that you've been blessed. We are so thankful for the body of Christ and, um, and being able to have the technology to be able to come into our homes via computer, smartphones, uh, tablets, iPads, however you all can see. We even have smart TVs where people can pull up the internet on their TVs and watch and worship the Lord. And it's such a great demonstration of how the body of Christ is not confined to four walls on just a Sunday, but throughout the week we can even gather together in times like this virtually. So I'm grateful to have this opportunity. Just a couple of announcements, and then we're going to dive into our message for today. Um, First is that throughout the week, uh, we are continuing in our Bible study. So this Wednesday, from the next few weeks, we're going to be meeting. Instead of the grow groups on Wednesday night and Thursday nights, we'll all come together via Zoom. I send a link out, and we all come together 
on Wednesday night at 7.15, 7.15 Wednesday nights. So I'm inviting you to join in, and uh, you can invite some friends. Even if they don't want their faces showing, you know, they can, their name can be on there, and they can just listen if that's what they want to do. But uh, it's a great time, and we had a great time this past Wednesday, and I'm praying that um, we continue to. And one of the things that I loved, uh, I, of course, love Bible study. Love it. Love diving into the Word. Love having that dialogue when it comes to the Word of God. But also, even just seeing you all's faces and just kind of catching up and seeing your smiles. And um, I, I have missed you all, and I'm so glad to be able to see your faces and to be able to even interact with you all. So uh, we want to take advantage of that. And then periodically through the week, I may send a message out and say, hey, at this time in the afternoon, we'll come on Zoom and just catch up, have a time of prayer, time of encouragement. We did it last week. It was real short, but it was awesome. And so uh, I think uh, many of you all enjoyed it as well, maybe as, and hopefully as much as I did. And we want to continue to do that also. Um, lastly, for our announcements is that we'll continue in using our curriculum for our children. If you haven't received uh, that link, if you haven't received the code, please let us know. Email us on the church uh, email us right there on the website. Um, you'll see it. If, if you're looking at us on Facebook, you go into the Facebook link, you'll see our email. But please email us because we do want to get that information to our children so they continue to grow in the Lord as well. So um, that's it for our announcements for now. More will be coming to you via email. Uh, some things will be posted on social media, and then some things may just be posted on the members' WhatsApp as well, but we'll communicate to you, let you all know what's going on, and as we receive information from our government leaders about how we ought to continue to proceed uh, through this pandemic, uh, through this coronavirus, we'll be relaying that information to you as well. Um, at the end of service, we will have a special prayer time because we have gotten word that some in our own congregation have had family members that have suffered, and uh, we don't want to forget that. So um, in this online service, at the end, we're going to have a special prayer time. So I'm letting you all know that because when the message is over, I don't want you to just cut the link off. I want you to pray with us as we come together to the Lord in prayer. Well, with that said, I'm going to invite you to go ahead, grab your Bibles, grab uh, your smart device, your, your phone, your computer, however you uh, want to dive into the Word today, whatever's most comfortable for you. But I want you to get your um, Bible because even though it's on the screen, I want you to be familiar with your text, to be able to highlight, underline, whatever you need to do that's going to help the Word stick, help it resonate in your spirit and so that's why I'm inviting you to go ahead and get your Bible and go to Luke 19. We're going to be in Luke 19 today. Luke 19, we're going to start at verse 28. Luke 19, starting at verse 28. Uh, but before we read, this passage we're going to read had me think about uh, how in our culture, especially even in the West, we have different holidays that we pick to celebrate the one we love. And on those days, we do special things. We, we set plans up, you know, uh, on that day, whether it's a birthday, whether it's an anniversary, whether it's Valentine's Day, or if it's just another special date between, say, like a couple, um, one of those people will set plans, dinner, you know, an excursion. They, they may have certain gifts that they want to lavish on someone, but they go through great effort to show that on this day, we've picked, I've chosen it, and I want to lavish you. I want to demonstrate my love and devotion to you. So we experience that yearly, annually. We experience that throughout the year at different times in our culture. Uh, that came to my mind when I read this passage in Luke 19, where we're celebrating today, Palm Sunday, the Sunday where Jesus entered into Jerusalem, uh, presented himself as king. And, and we, we've seen the stories, we've seen plays, we've seen cartoons, we've seen movies uh, where the people are, are waving palm branches. Uh, they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna on the highest. You know, uh, we, we've heard many times this description, but today I want us to take a look 
I want us to take an examination of Luke's account because each of the gospel writers portray this event. And today we're going to focus in, we're going to zero in on Luke's account, and we're going to see how this date was pinpointed, it was chosen by the Lord himself to demonstrate his love for us. And we're going to pick up in verse 28 of Luke 19. It says, when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of the disciples and said, go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the young donkey, its owners said to them, why are you untying the donkey? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now, he had come near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Verse 41. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surrounding you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground. And they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Now, this passage for many is familiar. This scene is familiar. But as we examine what Luke is saying, it's very important for us to understand of what the inspired writer is communicating about this event. You know, just before this, Jesus had visited with Zacchaeus, a, a tax collector, and he had come into his house and announced that this was the time of salvation for you, which, you know, was confusing to a lot of people because those like Zacchaeus was considered, you know, kind of unsavable. You know, those, those were the evil people. Those weren't the people of God. Like, why would you use that kind of language? But Jesus was making a point of what his mission was to accomplish. And then right after this, Luke records a parable of the, the ten men, and uh, in there he speaks of this noble one who had gone off to be king, but he had left people in charge to steward what he gave them. And he returned, and those who stewarded well what was given, they were rewarded. Those who did not steward well what was given to them by the king were punished, and those who were against the king were punished as well. And then Luke records this entrance. Luke is set in this scene so that we may understand the significance of what Palm Sunday was all about. He's set in this scene and he's showing us that as Jesus was entering in, all of this was to make a point. He's not just recording history because, yeah, indeed it is history, but he's making a point of what all this means that Jesus is doing what his disciples are doing, even what it means when the Pharisees and those who are confused and those who are against Jesus's mission, what it all means. And Jesus himself sets this scene. He sets everything up and he's trying to communicate to us, to the readers, who Jesus is and why he came to do what he came to do. Now, it's interesting when you think about this because we see this scene of Jesus sending out his disciples and they go get this donkey and then they, he comes back and he's riding down and they're, they're singing this song and 
all this is happening, and it, it, it made me think of, you know when you were a little kid or, or your, one of your children, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, uh, they've been requesting a gift, and you got this gift by surprise. And they don't know you giving it to them, but you, you've gotten it for them, and you wrap it up. And when you give it to them, they're, they're tearing it open, and you see this shift and this change as they start to recognize what they're opening up. You know, they go from getting a gift and maybe some excitement, maybe some curiosity, but as they tear the paper, they see, you know, that that emblem, they see that that color, they see whatever it is that alerts them, this is what I this is what I was waiting on. This is what I was expecting. And as they open it up, there's a joyfulness, there's a cheerfulness, there's an excitement where they just burst out in thankfulness. They burst out in praise and joy. That's exactly what's happening in this passage. That's exactly the scene that Jesus is setting when it comes to this event. Now, it's important to recognize that in Luke 9, Luke alerts his reader. He alerts the reader that Jesus has set his sight on Jerusalem. Now, this is significant because it's almost like Luke's been going and he's been telling all this history and all these things about Jesus. But then he drops this nugget in there in Luke 9 where he says that he set his sights on Jerusalem, meaning now the rest of this gospel is pointing towards something that Jesus is going to go do in Jerusalem. And now this is where he's headed. And he's come up on Bethany and Bethpage, and they are going out to fulfill what Jesus requested them to do. Now, he sends disciples and they go uh, to get this donkey. And isn't it interesting how Luke frames this? He says that they go out and Jesus tells them now, if the owners ask, so what is Jesus letting us know? He letting us know somebody else owns this donkey. Somebody else owns this animal. And when those owners ask, just simply say, the Lord needs it. He doesn't explain it. He doesn't, now, there are people that, you know, try, we try to wrestle with this, and we do try to understand, you know, historical context. And some people have argued that, well, maybe uh, it was understood that, you know, Jesus was the true owner, you know, possible. Unlikely based off what Jesus says, but, you know, listen, what are the other options? He said, likely that uh, they knew those who owned the donkey knew about Jesus, and they were maybe even followers of Jesus. So when it said the Lord needs it, they knew that he was talking about Jesus, and they were like, oh yeah, give it to Jesus. But also, that's not what's written in the text. Jesus just simply said the Lord needs, the Lord needs it. Now, why is this significant, and why is Luke communicating to us? He's letting us know, and I want you to pinpoint this. If it's in your Bible, I want you to underline it. I want you to take note of this. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Right there in this language that Luke, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writes is that he's pointing to something supernatural. It, it, it's possible that they knew Jesus and they knew they were talking about Jesus, but that's not what he communicates here. He's trying to let us know. He's signaling us and he's going to continue to unfold this. This is a divine appointment. And they go, and he even says when they go, they find everything just like Jesus told them. Just like it. He's communicating who Jesus is and how he's characterizing Jesus, how he's setting the scene. He says that they found everything just like Jesus said. And then he uses this language about an untied donkey, about uh, hadn't been ridden before. Why is this all so significant? You know, there's a verse in Zechariah 9.9 that the prophet wrote years before, centuries before. And he says this, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble, riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You telling me that the stage is being set and Jesus goes to have his disciples go get this donkey and they bring it to him and he's riding on this donkey just like this prophet years before spoke of? Now we see 
why the disciples are rejoicing. It's like that kid opening up that gift. When they see, it's just like Jesus said. That they grew up in, you know, in, in, in the Jewish synagogues. You know, they went to the, the Jewish Sunday school. We're not being facetious, but they, they learned in the scriptures. And this is alerting them like, hold on, this is something that we've been waiting on. And what do they do? They start singing songs of praise. They sing in verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. You know what they're singing? They actually are singing right here in verse 38. Psalm 118, verse 26. They're singing. They're excited. They recognize this is a divine appointment. This is what we've been waiting on. This is the king we've been waiting on. Now, if you go back through Luke's gospel, there's a lot of confusion on what this king was supposed to look like. What was this Christ? What was this Messiah really going to look like? You know, like, 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 is he coming to save us and deliver us from Rome? Will he take the yoke of Rome off of us so that we can now be our own theocratic nation of Israel like the days of old under King David? Is this what this Messiah is? And they are celebrating because they see, hold on, this is happening just like the prophet said. And they're singing Psalm 118. Now, now, for my Bible students, you know, you may notice some of the other gospels make reference to the the, the, the word Hosanna. We sang it in our time of worship, Hosanna, meaning save now. But remember, Luke is writing to a Gentile audience. That word Hosanna, that, that's a Hebrew word. You know, that's, that's more for, for Hebrew speakers or those who read Hebrew as a proclamation, as an exclamation of the salvation of God himself, of Jehovah, of the Lord, of Yahweh himself. Now, Luke doesn't record that, but we do know that that event was happening. But I want us to take note. What does Luke say? He says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. He is painting this royal picture. You know, Psalm 118 was about the deliverance of the Lord. And it also speaks to the coming king into the temple. This is exciting. And this is why, like that kid opened up that present, that the disciples are shouting for joy because they recognize this is the king we've been waiting on. They, they put their clothes on top of the donkey. The donkey hadn't been ridden, which was usually what was used. And it's a young donkey. It's a coat. So it hadn't been used before. It's, it's reserved for a special occasion. They throw their clothes on the ground so that the donkey is an act of humility and, again, royalty. And he coming down the Mount of Olives to enter into Jerusalem. I love this because what God is showing is how faithful he is to his word. He is faithful to fulfill his promises. This Palm Sunday, I want us to hold on to this truth. I want us to hold on to this fact that how Christ set the stage, of how God himself set the stage in every way to show that his word is true and faithful so that we may trust him. He's faithful. He's calling us to trust him. And in every event that's unfolding, he's saying that God is coming through just like he foretold. But we got a problem. We got a problem. Not, not everybody is excited. Not everybody is singing. Not everybody is celebrating God's faithfulness here. You know, th there is a such thing as having a righteous indignation for things. You know, meaning when you see something atrocious, when you see something vile, when you see something evil, you know, we should have a righteous indignation like that shouldn't be. You know, sometimes we see something on the news and someone has gotten so taken advantage of, somebody has been so harmed or abused, and we realize, and it was interesting, even the non-believer, even the one who denies the existence of God, God has placed something in us to the point when we see something vile and evil, we recognize that shouldn't be. As people of God, if we see something evil, if we see something that does offend God, we should get upset about it. We should feel how God feels 
When there is injustice, when there is evil, when there are people that are abused, manipulated. I say that because righteous indignation is good. The sad thing is when we get upset about what God is doing. Like, sometimes we can miss the mark and we think it's a righteous indignation. We can think, oh, that's evil. That that, that doesn't have anything to do with God. When we misunderstand or we have suppressed the truth of God and not recognizing what God is actually doing. Like, sometimes what we expect of God is not what God has even said about himself. And we have to be careful in those times if we get upset that we go back to what has God said? What has God revealed? Why do I say this? Because as all this is occurring, we see Psalm 118 being sung. We see that the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9 as the prophet spoke, that the disciples are cheering. They are excited about this king who saves. This king who's come to save and deliver them, but they recognize, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, this is what God is supposed to be doing, but I don't think this is really of God. And they say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. What he's saying is, Jesus, you need to tell them to quit singing that song because this doesn't fit. These particular Pharisees have a grave misunderstanding of what God is doing in this moment. They recognize Scripture, but they think what these disciples are doing, they think what Jesus is doing is blasphemous because they have failed to yet recognize who Jesus is. They recognize he's a teacher. They even say a teacher. They recognize him as a rabbi. They, they're, they're, they're even present when this is happening. So there's an intrigue. There's a curiosity. But they have failed to fully realize who Jesus is. And they get upset. And they're in lows. They're in lies the problem. Getting upset over the things of God because we think we know better than God. We think we got God all figured out. And if it doesn't match exactly what we think, we got a problem. But God, in his omniscience, in his wisdom, in his sovereignty, has gone to these great lengths to show us who he is, how he functions, how he rolls, ultimately showing himself in Jesus Christ. They're upset. They say, like, you need to quiet them down. And Jesus' response is, is somewhat comical. Jesus' response says, look, man, he, Jesus' response is basically like, y- y- y'all ain't recognized. You don't recognize. Like, right now, they, they have to sing. He says, if they don't sing, the stones will cry out. Now, I, I, I've heard that be used a whole lot. Like, you know, we use that for like, God can use anybody. You know, he'll even make the stones cry out. If you notice, that's not what he's saying. One, that's a figure of speech that we see even amongst the Jews, even amongst uh, the nation of Israel in Habakkuk 2.11. That's a phrase that's used to communicate absolute truth. But what Jesus is saying that the truth of what is occurring It is no more possible for them to keep silent than it is for stones to cry this out. He's letting us know that he was like, what is occurring right now is so important that it has to be sung about. It has to invoke praise. And what are they praising? What does Luke tell us? It says that they are joyfully, they're singing and they're rejoicing in a loud voice the miracles they have seen. Meaning they are recognizing Jesus is who we've been waiting on, even when they haven't fully realized all of what Jesus came to do. They are singing and they are glorifying God and they are singing and they are celebrating the supernatural and what they have experienced in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is letting them know they can't be 
it's, it, it, it's so impossible for them to be quiet as it's impossible for these stones to cry out. Like they got to sing about it because they are recognizing what God has done. And in, in this, what is occurring? Jesus has to rebuke their rebuke. And because of their rejection against Jesus, which is even showing that there's going to be a citywide rejection of Jesus. In verses 41 through 44, Jesus declares what is to come because of their rejection of God, because they have refused to fully trust, fully obey, to fully place faith in the work of God, there are consequences. You know, when, when, when Jesus makes this next statement, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's very similar. You ever watch the game show? You know, you have different game shows where a contestant is up and they're competing for prizes or for money. And uh, we as the audience, especially on TV, we as the TV audience, we can see what's behind, you know, both curtains. We see, like, if they choose this one, if they choose correctly, if they answer correctly, man, they're going to get, like, $50,000. They're going to get this car. They're going to get this jet ski. They're going to get, you know, this, they're going to get this, this great prize. But over here, if they choose wrongly, like, they lose, like, everything. Like, it's, it's dire. It's, it's, it's dangerous. You know, even on some of the old kids' shows, you know, you choose one right door, it was like a great surprise. You choose the other one, it's like disgusting, you know, slime and just all kind of nastiness fall all on you. Jesus has that view where he understands every scenario and he weeps over the city in verse 41 in Luke 19. Because he states, they have failed to recognize the peace that God is bringing the peace that God is providing, the victory, the triumph that God is providing. Now, I want us to notice this about this peace situation. Luke uses in verse 38, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Here, he goes over here and he says, if you knew this day what would be peace, you know, Jesus is using this language and this is language very similar Going back to the birth of Jesus, this peace that Jesus, the Lord, was coming into the earth to bring. Jesus let them know that they have failed to recognize the peace that he was bringing between heaven and earth, between God and man. And because they have rejected that peace, because they have rejected that work, they are now going to suffer the consequences of their rejection of God. Man, that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. Because that same truth is the same truth for us every day that our rejection of God, our rejection of Jesus, our rejection of the work of Jesus brings about dire consequences. And their consequences, Jesus professes, Jesus tells them what is to come because of their rejection. And it actually occurred in AD 70 when Rome seized the city. They razed the city. The temple was destroyed and the Jews were dispersed. Jesus says that was to occur because of the rejection of the work of God in Jesus Christ. Now, this is not a, 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 a bashing against the Jews. This is not a bashing. This is not anti-Semitic language because Jesus was presenting himself and he was letting them know all of this was to occur so that they would turn their faith to the Lord. They would turn their faith to Jesus himself and what he came to do. Jesus cries. And I love that Luke lets us know that, that Luke communicates this part of Jesus' you know, like sometimes we think Jesus was fully man and he was fully God. And sometimes we lean so far on that fully God side that we fail to realize the humanity of Jesus Christ in the incarnation that he's brought to tears when he thinks about the consequences of our sin. Meaning when we suffer consequences, it's not like Jesus is happy. 
<laughs> it's not like he's rejoicing. He, you know, the consequences of sin is really just because of our rejection of God, our rebellion, ultimately even going back to Adam and Eve. And this is the whole point of the gospel, of what Jesus came to save us from. You know, in this message, we see this triumphant entry for a different victory. It's a triumphant entry for a different kind of victory. Why do I say that? Because there was an expectation that this Messiah would come and just free the nation from foreign rule, where they didn't recognize Jesus was coming to set the world free to offer the forgiveness of sin, to deliver us from the consequences of sin and even death itself. And this is why we have this triumphant entry, because he as the king to be promised wasn't just to be this earthly king. This is a cosmic king that will overthrow sin and death, that will overthrow the kingdom of darkness and ultimately bring in the kingdom of light. See, this is significant, and this is why it means so much. You know why it means so much? Why they were singing Psalm 118? It wasn't just they were singing the words of Psalm 118. Uh, In verse 24 of Psalm 118, it's a very familiar verse. It's something that we say all the time, and most times we misuse it. Now, we can't apply it, but we need to know why this is significant. Psalm 118, verse 24, it said, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Right after that is Hosanna. Right after that, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is why Jesus says it's impossible for them to be quiet because it's, it's impossible for them just as it is. If the stones were to cry out, this was a day marked by the Lord himself. Like this day. He may be sitting there like, hold on, why? it's so significant that what's happening here is that in Daniel, the prophet Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 26 spells out when the Messiah is to come. Mathematicians have already shown this to be true, that during this time period is when the Messiah was to come to the T, to the day presenting himself. So when Jesus showed himself riding on this coat, just like Zechariah said, it's in the same time that Daniel said it would occur. And what they sing is, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the salvation of the Lord himself is come. That's why this is so big, y'all. That's why Palm Sunday is so big. That's why we celebrate this Sunday and we wave palm branches because as the other gospel writers wrote, the palm branches represented victory. It represented triumph. This is a triumphant entry for a different victory. Jesus wasn't coming in to just get rid of Rome. He was coming in to get rid of sin. And he was doing it for the world. And he cries over the city. Why? Because remember the parable right before this? When the king returns... There's reward and there's judgment. Jesus is painting this full picture of what it means for his mission and what he was to accomplish. And that those who place faith, those who follow, those that are fully committed to him will be rewarded. Those who are against him, those who have mismanaged, those who have kicked him to the curb will Suffer consequence. Jesus lays this all out. You know, and I, I love this passage and I love how Luke is presenting this because I, I, I read something from a, uh, what we describe as a Messianic Jew, meaning an ethnic uh, Jewish author. He wrote about his um, coming to trust Jesus as Messiah, to trust Yeshua HaMashiach. To, to trust that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And in his own testimony, he said as he studied, he, one thing he read that the Messiah, according to the old covenant, must come and visit the temple. Well, that means he had to come before A.D. 70. And this is what got his attention to go back and look at all the prophecies that would have happened with Messiah. And that brought him to faith that Jesus is the one whom they've been waiting on. But it's a different victory. 
is not just from a human oppressor. It is for a cosmic salvation and a great salvation indeed. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This Palm Sunday is to remind us so that we may devote ourselves to God, the creator of the universe, so that we may place our full commitment and trust in him. He has so demonstrated his love. He has so demonstrated his faithfulness that the salvation that's offered in Jesus Christ is sure. So my hope is, my prayer is that as we celebrate, that as we Read this story. Go back and read it again. Keep on reading. Read about the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension. Keep on reading because I want you to know God is faithful. And this whole celebration on Passion Week, it's not just to have a good time. You know, we're used to having all kinds of festivities. I'm actually kind of excited that we can't do all the normal festivities as normal. We have to just straight up focus on the truth. And the truth is... Christ came into the world to save sinners like me and you. May we all place our full faith, trust, and hope in the Lord who loves us and has saved us from our sins. Amen? Amen. Come on, right where you are, I want you to give the Lord God a hand, a hand clap of praise right now. He has been so good. He's been so faithful. And I pray that his word just richly blesses you. Uh, thank you all for worshiping with us. I pray that this word, I pray that this message, I pray that this, this word just in, his, in, in, in the scripture just blesses your heart and reassures you. And if, and if you haven't trusted Christ, I'm inviting you right now. Don't just take my word for it. Go to the text. Go to the text. Ask the Lord. You may be an unbeliever. You may not feel like anybody's listening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you. If, you like, if you're a person who likes to be challenged, I'm going to challenge you right now. Just, just, just speak out loud. Say, God, if you are there, if there's a God, I, I, show yourself to me. Now, there's a lot of ways he can do that. Some ways are pleasant. Some ways not so pleasant. But God is faithful to show himself. This time right here, this whole virus epidemic, this is a, God is speaking. Don't think that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the God of the universe who created all, slipped up and is like, what's going on? What's happening? No, no, he's either doing it or he's allowing it. And he's doing it for a purpose that he's getting our attention. One way he's getting our attention, we all are recognizing that we are mortal. We all are coming up on our limitations, what we actually can't control. We're seeing young, old, rich, poor deal with this situation. Where's the answer? I'm going to tell you right now. We do live in a sinful, fallen world. The ultimate answer is Jesus. And this triumphant entry we read about today was for a different victory. Not just over sickness, but he gives us victory over death itself, that we may have eternal life with him. So I'm going to invite you. You trust Jesus right where you are. I can tell you this sinner's prayer. Whatever you need to say, I just say, Lord, I, I trust you. And if you want to know what to do, next steps, contact us, email us, message us on our Facebook, however you need to get with us. And that's what the church is for. We help each other grow in the Lord. And I pray that you can experience the joy and the forgiveness of the Lord for sure. Well, as we get ready to close, one of the things that we always do is we end our worship time with a time of worship in giving. And in our giving, this is something that's very important because it allows us to worship God. It allows us to express in another way our thankfulness and being a part of God's mission. You know, as as salvation is free for us, Christ paid it. But when we do missions, when we do ministry, we do have costs. And even in this time, we have certain responsibilities. And when we come out of this pandemic. When we can gather together, y'all know I can't wait to hug all, hug all y'all and kiss you on the forehead and just love on you. I, I can't wait for that time. But when we come out of this, I want us to be strong. I want us to be vibrant. I, I, my prayer is that we don't be in a hole, that we, we don't be bad off, but we come out even stronger so that we can minister to a watching world. So 
our options are given. You know, we have our give online. We have our cash app. It's right there on the screen. We have even our text to give. So the cash app is the handle with the, with the dollar sign with Rock Fellowship FL. The text to give is an option. You can just send a text message and set that up if you set that up. And then the online option, you go to the rockfellowshipfl.org slash give. But your giving, your generosity, your faithfulness to the Lord is not in vain. Uh, also, for those that uh, email, we have some people that want to use, you want to mail in a check. You don't want us to incur any fees. You want all your funds to go to the ministry of the Lord. You can mail a check. The P.O. box is there as well. Please send that. We'll get that to you. And um, I do thank you for your generosity. Um, closing announcements, and then we're going to have a special time of prayer, as I said. It won't be long, but I want us to pray together for what's going on. Is closing announcement. Remember, this week, Wednesday night, 7.15, we will have Bible study, and that link will be sent to you all. I will send it out as an email and on the WhatsApp, so be looking for that. And I'm going to try to send it out probably around 7.13, so we can come on at 7.15 and everybody can join in together, somewhere right around there. And then also um, our children's ministry. Remember, use those links, use those materials so that God can continue to minister to our children. Um, and uh, we're excited because even next Sunday, we got some special things for Easter Sunday. And again, even though we can't gather, we're going to be reflecting on the truth of God. Um, we, we, we worship him in spirit and truth. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, I said lastly, but that, 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 that actually wasn't accurate because I just thought of something. I even shared this week, I'm going to be sending things through the week that uh, we can be reading together and we can be worshiping and praying together over certain things throughout the week as we celebrate our, our Holy Week, our Passion Week, leading up to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. So thank you all. And come on, let's pray. And we're going to dismiss. Father, you sit on the throne. You are God all by yourself. We belong to you. Everything in this world belongs to you. So, Father, we come now in a time of just special prayer, closing out this service. But, Lord, we pray for the families that have lost loved ones. We, we've had some family members in our church that have had some uncles pass away, that have had aunts. We, I even personally have a good friend of mine whose mother is battling this sickness and even just found out last night I have a cousin whose wife and daughter uh, are on their fifth day of recovery. And I praise God for that, Lord. And we know some are recovering, some are not. We have some that are, are going through really, really tough times and some who are not experiencing as bad of symptoms. But Father, we pray that through this, you as God, you as creator of the heavens and the earth, that you give your supernatural comfort that you give your supernatural peace. And for those that don't know you, Lord, this be a time that they can come to know you. For the medical professionals that may not know you, that through this, they come to understand our limitations in our humanity. But there's something, there's someone who is greater. And may this draw us to you. And Father, I pray that we as the body of Christ, as people have questions, as people are wrestling with all that's going on, that we as your sons and daughters can be your arms and feet. We can be your mouth and tongue to be able to relay in word and deed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us discernment. And we will give you all the glory and honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. God bless you. And I'll see you Wednesday and next Sunday.
echoing. 